Click, I hope you have learned to not tolerate such behavior in your server. I hope that you have learned from this and that you'll continue to strive to do better. I truly regret ever being friends with you. And I hope that I can finally close the door on that chapter in my life. I want nothing to do with you, and I can only hope that I will no longer be associated with you after all of this. Then I think I've shown enough in this video to clear my name and show that she has consistently presented half-truths and twisting events to their worst possible interpretation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a tale of exposés, betrayal, infighting, war, lawsuits, and just, in general, every little bad thing that you can possibly think of in a YouTube drama situation. Doesn't this sound familiar? For those of you guys who've seen me cover stuff in the past involving Illuminati, Wait. I'll get into how over time Blair would have controlled every aspect of my life via transportation, income, and housing. It comes with the cost of full control of his life. She is not just his friend, but his landlord, car leaser, and boss. Paranoia, lashing out at people. And you know, honestly, as you'll find out, you can't spell Illuminati without a whole lot of L's. Just put it all into one big mixer, blend it up, and what do you have? You've got the Illuminati. I, I don't actually know how to pronounce her name correctly. The Illuminati is in the name, but people say Illuminati. You've got the Blair situation. Poor management. These are all things that anybody who has had a negative experience with Illuminati has encountered. To once again, just say, I take accountability for my actions. Literally every single one. Felt cute, thought I'd film a video today. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. Felt hungry, thought I'd eat some Chicago deep dish pizza today. <laughs> Lumel Nadi's confirmed. Netflix canceled season three of Inside Job because it was getting too real and too close to the truth. Shadow government confirmed. <laughs> All right, enough stupid jokes. Sorry, let's get on topic. Illuminati is an animated YouTube channel run by a woman named Blair who represents herself as a cartoon character with a pyramid for a head. And that is to have sharks with freaking laser beams attached to their heads. Much like my channel and many other channels in genres like mine, Illuminati covers a wide range of topics from the dangers of multi-level marketing companies or MLMs, the downfalls of various shady corporations, and exposés on unethical business practices that companies engage in beneath the surface. Yes, Mr. Cox, for you. You're fired! I first found this channel about four years ago. See, one thing about me is that I love to fall asleep listening to YouTube videos. And four years ago, my favorite type of videos to fall asleep to were Reddit videos or videos where YouTubers go into various Reddit threads and read the most dramatic posts out loud, then react to the posts and share their thoughts. I don't know why I enjoyed falling asleep to these videos so much. There was just something calming about listening to them. And at the time, Illuminati was primarily a Reddit YouTuber, meaning that she would go onto various subreddits, often the anti-MLM subreddit, which was my favorite, and read the posts there while giving her commentary. Over time, Blair's channel evolved, as many YouTube channels do, and she moved away from the Reddit reaction content and into more documentary-style deep dive content. Holy moly! Which I liked even more. The deep dive style videos were where Blair's channel really thrived, and she began to gain hundreds of thousands of subscribers. At its peak this past April, Illuminati had about 1.7 million subscribers on the channel, though Blair's channel is now down to about 1.4 million subscribers, having lost nearly 300,000 subscribers during the past two months. And that's a pretty big deal. Even though she still has over a million subscribers, losing nearly 20% of your subscriber base is bad. A rule of thumb that many creators on YouTube follow is the 10% rule. As long as your videos are getting 10% as many views as the total number of subscribers you have, you're doing all right. Often, a lot of subscribers on YouTube channels are casual viewers who pop in from time to time, and some are people who subscribed a long time ago but whose accounts are now dead or not active anymore. Basically, no YouTuber really has 100% of their subscribers active at all times. And when 20% of people who were subscribed to you dislike you enough to go out of their way to hit the unsubscribe button, you know you fucked up. So how did this happen? How did Blair go from being one of the leading voices in the anti-MLM movement on YouTube, second only to probably CoffeeZilla at this point, who's closing in on 3 million subscribers and has literally been on the Joe Rogan show to talk about this stuff? How did she go from that level of fame and respect to being universally distrusted by a wide segment of her former fans? I hate you! Well, it's because it's not just about her former fans, it's also her former friends, and her former employees, and her former 
friends turned employees or employees turned friends who were often one and the same until they lost both of those titles. You are the weakest link! We all know about the best romance trope of all time, right? It's childhood friends to enemies to lovers, there's no contest. Well, in Blair's case, all of her relationships were friends to employees to enemies. And that does not bode well for our tragic heroine. We often hear the phrase, don't mix business and pleasure. Well then explain to me how a putt-putt golf company operates. People talk about this when they want to discuss the importance of work-life balance or the moral and ethical struggles that can come with mixing our financial security and our emotional security. And while it may seem like don't mix business and pleasure could be the thesis of today's video, that's actually not the direction that I want to take it. Because, controversial as this may be, I don't actually think there's anything wrong with working with and for your friends and family. I do it all the time, but it's a situation that can require a lot more foresight and a lot more careful navigation, and that's what I want to discuss today. At first, I wasn't planning to make a video on the downfall of Illuminati. I figured so many creators have already covered this topic, from iNabber's comprehensive timeline videos, to Tipster's multiple streams covering this topic, to Julie Joe's anti-MLM community perspective on the topic, and all of these creators did a fantastic job covering the controversies going on. I highly recommend that you guys go and watch all of those as well. At this time, I was kind of like, do I even need to talk about this? Would I have anything new to say? But the more I delved into the root causes of Illuminati's downfall and the more I saw the ways that this conflict went beyond typical YouTube drama and into the realm of business and employment ethics, I realized I actually did have something to say. So I'm gonna say all of it, let's go. Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. What's up, my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy. Welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business, where we cover a variety of topics from book reviews, reviewing books about businesses, talking about businesses that produce books, talking about the anti-multi-level marketing movement, talking about book publishing and literature and all that good stuff. If any of those type of topics interest you, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel because I put out new videos on those topics every week and you won't want to miss them, so don't forget to ring the little notification bell. I'd also like to give a quick thank you to my Patreon supporters. Today's video was brought to you by my Patreon supporters. I greatly appreciate everyone who supports this channel. Y'all, don't forget to take a look in the description below where all my Patreon supporters who contribute $5 a month and up have the option to link their own social media pages, cause they want to promote their own small business, whatever they want. Go ahead and check them out there and show them some love and support. And if you're interested in getting behind the scenes looks at how I make videos, how I run my own businesses, writing tips, advice, all that type of stuff, you can check out my Patreon page as well, where I post a new blog post every week delving behind the scenes into all of this. You can take a look at that in the description below. Also, if you like the dress I'm wearing, I did the art for it. It's available on my fashion and merch website, hipsterunicorn.myshopify.com, which is also linked in the description below, so you can check that out there. Enough self-promo. Let's get back to the topic. So when did the downfall of Illuminati begin? Many people have been saying that it's like a couple months ago on 420, blaze it, on April 20th when she first got into a conflict with the YouTuber Legal Eagle. And we will cover that whole situation, don't worry. But first, I think we need to rewind a little. I think we need to rewind a little and head back to the year 2020. Oh, we're all gonna die. The first controversy that I noticed of Illuminati's happened almost three years ago, back when she spread and exacerbated existing drama within the anti-MLM community. The anti-MLM community comprises a variety of YouTube, Instagram, Reddit, and TikTok content creators who make educational videos, posts, reels, and more all about the dangers of multi-level marketing companies and the ways that pyramid schemes and companies like pyramid schemes can destroy people's lives. Even though a lot of my content is about books and publishing and small business ownership in general, I still consider myself to be part of that community in some ways since I do make a lot of anti-MLM videos on this channel. Other creators you may know in this genre include Savannah Marie, Kiki Chanel, Monica Hayworth, Recovering Hanbot, Cruel World Happy Mind, Coffeezilla, Mooncat, Spencer Cornelia, Mike Winnett, Roberta Blevins, Brianna Jewell, Not the Good Girl, and of course, <laughs> Illuminati. But to fully understand the situation, first I think we're gonna need to talk about a name that y'all probably haven't heard of in a while, and that is a creator named Kimberlea. 
For some of y'all, this is going to be a throwback, and for others, this is going to be a completely new rabbit hole to fall down. But in order to understand the full scope of what happened with Illuminati, first we must answer this question. Who is Kimberleya? A woman called Kimberleya. She is uh, an entrepreneur and a, a business advisor. She wanted to be like Illuminati. But she does not respect the law of fair use. She's trained as sort of a, a life coach as she submitted a copyright strike. And this is where she kind of really gets into her stating that she's never really aligned with the beliefs of the anti mlm community. Not a claim, a copyright strike against a small creator named Tiana Liss, which is completely um, legal. This wasn't what she had signed up for. She got carried up in a wave like of things and she wanted to distance herself from anti-MLM. Kimberleya was an anti-MLM YouTuber up until the beginning of 2021, at which time she had over 200,000 subscribers on her channel. At the time, that is late 2020 into early 2021, she was one of the biggest creators in the anti-MLM genre, with the only creators surpassing her in sub count being CoffeeZilla and Illuminati. <laughs> Nowadays, Kimberleya's channel is somehow even bigger at 375,000 subscribers, and she mostly makes true crime content that hits well over 100,000 views per video, so she's actually doing really well. Her cancellation didn't stick, like, at all. But behind the scenes, she was stirring controversy back in 2020, particularly controversy between Illuminati and fellow anti-MLM creator Cruel World Happy Mind. At this time, which was, again, late 2020 into early 2021, Cruel World Happy Mind was a newer YouTube channel with about 50,000 subscribers at the time, and Madison, who runs the channel, mostly focused on exposing scams, pyramid schemes, and other shady business practices. And she did a really great job at this, which is one reason that her channel grew so quickly. Because Madison was still fairly new to YouTube at this time, she was befriended by this woman, Kimberleya, who at the time was a much bigger creator with a much bigger platform and more experience creating videos about scams and MLM companies. Behind the scenes, though, Kimberleya was stirring up drama! So here's what happened. In 2020, Madison put out two videos about supermodel and TV host Tyra Banks. The reality is Tyra Banks is a businesswoman who has built most of her career and her empire around the exploitation and mistreatment of a young woman and under the guise of empowering them. Who used to run an MLM company called Tyra Beauty. After watching these videos, Kimberleya sent a DM to Madison saying, hey, there's a creator much bigger than you named Illuminati, and I think she copied your videos on this. They look shockingly similar. Madison has since come out as saying that at the time, since she was still new to YouTube, she trusted that Kimberleya was just looking out for her, so she decided to see if there was any truth to Kimber's theory that Blair was copying her. I'm talking about Tyra Beauty, so why discuss it at all if it's failed? But since then, Madison has realized that Blair wasn't copying her and felt bad for everyone engaging with the idea. But at the time, Madison sent Blair a message through Instagram, which is thankfully still documented in this two-year-old livestream from Tipster. Hey hun, sorry I had to. I don't know if you know my channel. I'm a really small YouTuber who has been really inspired by uh, the content you make. I got a few messages about the video uh, you posted about Tyrus MLM because I've done a video on that topic. I'm really happy you're spreading more awareness on this topic, uh, but it did low-key feel like a lot of what was said in the beginning of the video was really similar to the things I discussed regarding Tyrus MLM and her controversies, the rabies bit, etc. Coincidences happen, and I'm sure a larger YouTuber, uh, as a larger YouTuber, you're accused of stealing content from people you've never even heard of or seen before, so I get it if this message comes across that way. With the intention of just being open and honest, I was really hurt by the video though, because you're someone who has really inspired me and the content I make, so I wanted to reach out and hopefully have an honest but positive discussion on it all. Either way, I still appreciate the work you do. Honestly, I thought Madison's message here was super nice. I can see how if Blair had really never heard of Madison before, which who knows, maybe she hadn't, I can't read her mind, that maybe that message could have come off as accusatory somehow, because she'd just be like, girl, what are you talking about? But at the same time, I think Madison phrased everything very politely and did truly seem open to having a dialogue. Still, if this message did make Blair feel attacked in any way, that's her right, and it's up to her to send a message back either saying, I didn't copy you, I've never even seen your videos, this is just coincidence, or to ignore the situation and move on. But Blair did neither of those things. In fact, she reacted to this message in one of the most unprofessional ways possible. Blair started by ignoring the message by leaving Madison on red, and at first this didn't seem like a big deal. Madison just assumed that Blair got lots of messages and didn't have time to respond to them all. It seemed like everyone would just move on. 
but Blair didn't move on. Instead, she went on the Double Cleanse podcast, a show hosted by beauty guru Robert Welsh, where she suddenly started shit-talking Madison out of nowhere. Something I recently learned, apparently, is there is this whole, uh anti-MLM community. What I did have happen though recently, which this is, I don't, I'm going to try and keep it vague so I don't mention this person's channel, but uh, it's a, it's a very small YouTuber and she DM'd me on Instagram claiming that I copied her. Okay. I, was like, I was like, I was like, you can't claim that I'm copying you oh, when you no. use me as a source. I, obviously the first thing I did before even looking at her videos is I went to look at her sourcing list. But she had like five sources, you know, one was Wikipedia, one was BuzzFeed, one was like TMZ or Buzzfeed. something. Oh my! And then she sits down for a video, uh, maybe 30, 40 minutes long, drinks a coffee, is distracted the whole time, and just gives her opinion on how she feels about things. And I said, I said, <laughs> oh, you I cannot like believe for one second, ma'am, that I am copying you. You are yeah. giving an yeah. opinion. I don't yeah. do that. And Thank you once again to Tipster for archiving this clip. It's so funny how she's making fun of the quality of Madison's videos. Like, whatever type of content on YouTube you personally like is fine, but it's objectively true that Madison's videos are high quality. Even two years ago when this was happening, her videos looked like this. It's insane. Insane. They directly have had an impact on an entire industry. It's the same kind of tactic that MLM reps will use. If you follow my other videos, I talk a lot about MLMs and their shady business tactics. She's always cited her sources. She's always done quality work, even when her channel was brand new. So next, let's talk about some of the outright lies in Blair's statement here. First, can we talk about how she completely misrepresented Madison's message to her? Did Madison say, give me credit or directly accuse Blair of copying her? No, that's not what she said at all. But again, maybe that's how Blair interpreted it. And when we look back on conversations that we had, as humans, we are always going to look at them through the lens of the emotions we were feeling at the time. I can't believe how selfish you all are. But that doesn't explain why Blair lied about not knowing there was an anti-MLM community? Something I recently learned, apparently, is there is this whole, uh, anti-MLM community. Even within the context of the interview itself, what she says doesn't really make sense. I mean, first, Blair's statement about not knowing there was an anti-MLM community was obviously untrue. The place that I first found Illuminati's channel, remember, was through her reactions to the subreddit r slash anti-MLM. I used to fall asleep listening to those Reddit videos. I liked those a lot. Every Monday during Blair's multi-level Monday segment, she would read posts from r slash anti-MLM and she would react and respond to them. The subreddit r slash anti-MLM is run by a community of people who are against MLM companies and post about it online. So how could she not know that there was a community of people against MLMs if she was using that community's post in her videos. But let's say for the sake of the argument that maybe what Blair meant here was that she didn't know that there were other YouTube creators making videos against MLMs. Maybe she knew there was a Reddit community, but maybe she didn't know about the YouTube community. Well, that also doesn't make any sense because in that very interview, Blair throws other anti-MLM YouTube creators under the bus. Yeah, she shit talks Madison's videos from the perspective of I went and watched her channel after she DM'd me, so sure, maybe it's believable that she didn't know Madison specifically before that interaction. But she also makes a lot of statements about the community as a whole, claiming that no one else seems to have the real passion for the movement that she does. Putting half-assed information into the world yeah. and then turning around and then trying to be petty and attack other creators in the same space who are trying yeah. to spread a message of awareness is tacky and it cheapens the overall message. You're tacky and I hate you. Claiming that everyone else's videos are too reaction and tea based whereas hers are based on research and documentary filmmaking. But how could Blair even know that her videos were so much better if she was unaware that these other YouTube videos existed? Guys! I think she's just lying. So after this podcast episode came out, a lot of anti-MLM creators, especially those pouring their hearts and souls into YouTube videos, weren't super happy with Blair. To claim that she didn't even watch their content and then make assumptions about how it must be inferior to hers, even though she definitely didn't watch it in the first place to even have any way to know that, well, that hurt. 
In a video that Madison has now taken down, she responded to the situation. Here's what she had to say. My larger creator posted a video and I, out of the blue, started getting a ton of messages from people saying that this creator copied my video, saying they made a ton of similar points. So what ended up happening is I just remember one day seeing this comment, I'll put it up on the screen here, where someone was telling me they thought another creator like copied my video that I did. And I was like freaked out and I got a few other comments like that. So I was like, oh, this person thinks this creator copied my video. That's really weird. And me at the time, I don't even think I had 20,000 subscribers. So getting messages like that freaked me out because this creator had 600,000 subscribers and I had less than 20. And to hear so many people say the same thing about a situation and message me the same thing scared me. I never accused, straight up accused this creator, this larger creator of coffee. Illuminati's making statements that, oh, you know, she was attacking me. Uh, she was demanding credit. She was saying that like, you know, you definitely stole this from me. On top of that, something I didn't mention in that video and that this creator seems to conveniently also leave out of this whole story. At the time that people were messaging me this, there were no sources on this person's video. The only thing it had in the description was in parentheses, sources coming soon. Uh, she even took jabs at her content, how it was like basically implying that her content's lazy. But she had like five sources, you know, one was Wikipedia, one was Buzzfeed, one was like TMZ or Buzzfeed. something. Oh my. But I could not find anywhere where I used TMZ as a resource. I am a one woman show. I do all the research, editing, scripting, thumbnails and posting all on my own. After Madison put out this video, Blair announced that she would be doing a Twitch live stream exposing Madison for all of her lies. However, that stream never happened because thankfully the two of them were able to find some mutual common ground. On February 8th, 2021, Blair tweeted out a thread detailing the conversation that she and Madison had, which seemingly at the time looked like it was gonna resolve everything. Just got off the phone after a three hour conversation with Cruel World Happy Mind, and I am very happy that we were finally able to talk and resolve our issues privately. Ultimately, there was a series of misunderstandings from both sides. We have worked those out to stop the escalation of any drama. She will be removing her part about me in a video she recently did. And in return, I will not do the planned live stream on her. We were able to not only work out our problems, but come to common understanding and even have a great convo at the end about our research philosophies and interpretations on many parts of MLMs, our personal lives, etc. We both want the drama to end. There is no ill will here and we are moving on. I appreciate that we are both able to move on. And maybe once the restrictions in Colorado lighten up, we can hang out one day too. Madison, I appreciated the chat. We needed to have it. And I'm happy that we're on the same page on a vast majority of things. Thank you for coming into the convo level-headed with me so we could knock this out and move on. Now, the reason that we know all of this was started by this other creator, Kimberlea, is that she was doing the exact same thing behind the scenes to other creators, sliding into their DMs, trying to pit people against each other, and seeing if she could bait people into starting controversy. She also did this with Savannah Marie, with Emily Leah, with a bunch of other people. It was part of her grift. Kimberlea later admitted in a now deleted live stream that she never actually cared about exposing pyramid schemes and really just wanted to jump on a popular YouTube trend for the views. Later, she eventually joined the MLM company Monate and decided to characterize the rest of the anti-MLM community as mean girls for having criticized these companies in the first place. Because you are a mean girl! You're a bitch! Now she's off making true crime videos and living her best life. But it's funny, isn't it? how people who grow massive platforms for calling out scammers can sometimes be hiding in plain sight as massive scammers and manipulators themselves. It's what happened with Kimberlea more than two years ago, and now it seems to be the exact same situation we're seeing with Illuminati now, only on a much larger scale. After this entire drama with Madison had ended, I honestly didn't think that much about Illuminati for a while other than sometimes watching her videos. I think back in 2021, after Madison and Blair worked out their issues, I tweeted at both of them saying something along the lines of, thank God there's no beef between you anymore because I love both of your guys' videos. And I did. I continued watching Illuminati as a casual fan, especially enjoying her Corporate Casket series. I enjoyed that entire concept. The Corporate Casket where shady corporations go to die. It's the type of concept that was right up my alley. I liked some of the research that her videos provided on topics that I also wanted to cover on my channel, including the Hobby Lobby health insurance controversy that we saw a few years ago, various deep dives on MLM companies that I also plan to expose, and more. But unfortunately, this wasn't the end of Blair's tension with anti-MLM creators. Black Oxygen Organics, also known as BOO or BOO, is a multi-level marketing company that literally sells dirt. 
Or should I say, it was a company that sold dirt. Past tense is important here because the company has thankfully now shut down after concerted efforts from multiple online creators to expose their shady dealings. Boo was a Canadian company that sold products made from dirt. Like dirt from the ground. And customers were advised to put it on their face, take baths in it, and even ingest it by mixing it into water and drinking it. And then you were also supposed to recruit your friends to join the dirt pyramid so that they could drink glasses of dirt in water with you? Yes, this really actually happened. Boo has been defunct as of November 23rd, 2021, which followed a September 2021 recall of Boo products issued by Health Canada. Play Canada! Play Canada! That November, Boo received a Klax action complaint due to their products being found to contain lead and arsenic. And in December of 2021, the FDA told consumers to please stop eating the dirt. The dirt has arsenic and lead in it. Please stop eating the dirt. On September 6, 2021, Blair released a video called The Dirt on Boo, in which he discussed the ways that this company was scamming and harming its customers. Then, on October 24th, 2022, more than a year later, Blair released a second video on Boo called The Dirty Business of Black Oxygen Organics, in which she gave a similar overview of the company's harms, plus also their controversies, troubles with the law, and their eventual downfall. Around the same time that the FDA released its advisory, the FTC released a cease and desist letter to the company due to their unlawful advertisement that they treated COVID-19. So why did this cause controversy? After all, Illuminati was right. Boo was a terrible company. And the fact that she put out a video with over 300,000 views explaining the harm that they were doing, and then a second video with about 200,000 views detailing their outright lies to customers and showing proof of their intentional scams, well, that could only aid in the fight for consumer protection, right? Well, there was a bit more to the story. And this is where we need to approach the situation with a bit of nuance because yes, what Blair said in her video was all true. And her video is absolutely on the right side of history when it comes to MLM companies and to Boo in particular. But many fellow anti-MLM creators, especially smaller creators who had done all of the initial research and on the ground work in exposing Boo, including telling their own stories in a private Facebook group, sharing their own vulnerabilities after getting out of the company, they felt that Blair had taken their work. Now, this issue is multifaceted, so let's break it down. Basically, in 2021, the main online group working to take down Black Oxygen Organics was a Facebook group called Boo is Woo. The group was private due to the private nature of former Boo sellers telling their own stories when they were potentially afraid of backlash, but the team running that group was at the forefront of the effort to expose the company and create content to warn future customers against getting involved with the MLM. In this group, former Boo distributors told stories stories of how scammy the company was, how terrible the products were, and everything else you'd expect of testimonies from victims from a terrible, exploitative company. The group was set to private because many of these former distributors feared some sort of backlash from Boo, since within the anti-MLM community, a lot of us live in constant fear of receiving cease and desists or legal threats from companies much, much bigger than us with much, much more money and resources than we could ever hope to see. A bunch of my fellow creator friends in this community, including two of my best friends, Savannah Marie and Monica Hayworth, have both received cease and desists from MLM companies that they've discussed on their channels before. These companies like to threaten people who try to speak out against them. It's kind of their thing. They want no negativity at all, ex to the extent of being willing to squash all free speech and keep the positive vibes only bullshit going. Illuminati herself kind of does this too. We're going to get into that in a minute. As a result, in order to access the Boo is Woo Facebook group, you first had to be admitted and approved by one of the group's moderators. The group's moderation team was run by a series of anti-MLM YouTube and Instagram content creators. As anti-MLM videos are in her wheelhouse, Blair from Illuminati decided she wanted to make a video about Boo for her channel as well, which I think was a great idea. After all, she had a very large audience and the farther the message about this company's harms could spread, the better. It's well known at this point that Blair doesn't do all of the work for her channel herself. She hires others to help her with the research, the script writing, the video editing, the animation, all of that. And to be clear, I don't think that there's anything wrong with this. On the theme of hiring your friends, which is going to be a pervasive motif throughout this video, I'll say up front right now that this video is being edited by my long-term best friend, RK Gold, whom I hired as my video editor about a year ago when the workload of editing all these videos and doing everything else got to be too much for me to keep up with. I think that 
hiring other people to help with your projects and then of course compensating and crediting those people for their work is great. She did just fine with all of that. I mean, for now, it seemed like she did. We'll get into where she didn't actually do just fine with any of that in a bit here, okay? Hold your horses, buddy. But that was all the necessary background information because when it came to Boo is Woo as a Facebook group, Blair herself did not enter the group. Instead, her writer did. Back in 2021, Blair's writer requested to join the Boo is Woo Facebook group only to be denied entry. Moderators of the group cited their reasons that they didn't want this writer in their group as being an overall distrust of Blair herself. After all, this really wasn't super long after her big conflict with Madison from Cruel World Happy Mind, and it was just a few months after she'd gone on a podcast to claim that she'd never even heard of the anti-MLM community. Something I recently learned apparently is there is this whole, uh anti-MLM community. And then proceeded to detail the ways that her videos were better researched and less drama focused and whatever else. So it wasn't surprising that other creators in this genre were a little bit upset by Blair and didn't particularly want her to be the one profiting from their hard work and research. After being denied entry into the group, Blair's writer later tried again. This time, a different moderator who didn't have the full context of the situation ended up admitting her into the group. This writer was eventually removed from the group by another moderator later on, but she'd already gathered the research that she needed from this group. Later, when Blair made her first video on Boo back in September of 2021, in her sources linked in her description, the Boo is Woo Facebook group was credited as a source, proving that she did use the information she got there after she was told not to. So that's just a brief overview of the situation, and we're going to break this all down more thoroughly in a second. Now, as a quick disclaimer, I was not ever in this particular Facebook group. You can't sit with us! and I don't have any special inside information about it. At the time, I was cheering on my friends who were a part of the effort to take down Boo, especially my friends Savannah Marie and Kat Benson. Shout out to y'all, you guys are doing great work. But I personally didn't have the time to get involved with another effort at this point, so I was not part of this group. However, fellow anti-MLM YouTuber Julie Jo did a fantastic job covering this controversy a couple weeks ago, where she provided screenshots from the group showing evidence and proof of what happened with Illuminati. I'm Blair allegedly sent her writer into an anti-MLM group to use their insider info to make a video. You heard that right? Allegedly, she had one of her writers get into a Facebook group called Boo is Woo. Now, I might have a little bit of a different take on this issue than some of the other creators in my community on this, and I hope this doesn't get me canceled. Honestly though, I really can see both sides to this issue. I can see why the Boo is Woo group felt violated. I can understand why they felt that their work and their privacy hadn't been respected. I can understand why these group members were hesitant to let in a representative for a creator they didn't trust, especially when this group was dealing with private and sensitive information. At the same time, I can sort of understand Blair's perspective here, or at the very least the perspective of her writers and editors. The truth is, Blair's videos about Boo didn't really reveal any personal information about people in the group, at least from what I saw, and again, it's totally possible that there's some context I'm missing, so if you were part of this group and you disagree, feel free to leave me a comment below. But for the most part, it really just seemed like this video did do a good job exposing what was wrong with Boo as a company. At the end of the day, this Facebook group and Blair's channel were on the same side of the issue, and their efforts together did a lot of good in helping warn consumers against a harmful company. And I'll be honest, again, under the caveat of I wasn't actually in this group, so maybe I don't understand some of the nuances of the situation. I don't fully understand why the moderators didn't want Blair's writer in there. Yep, yeah, I agree that she'd been rude to creators in this community, but the video she was working on wasn't about the drama, it was about exposing a company that this group also wanted to expose. And the truth is, Blair had a huge platform at this time and her videos consistently raked in hundreds of thousands of views. I don't see why the Boo is Woo group didn't consider this to be a win. And I can understand the angle that like maybe the other creators in this group didn't like the idea of Blair just swooping pooping into the whole ordeal or jumping in and profiting off of other people's research. But I can't see why this group and Blair together couldn't have struck up some kind of agreement like, we'll let your writer into the group under the condition that you specifically shout out the smaller creators who did this work first and link them in your description and also this information is private and you're not allowed to use it. Like some kind of agreement like that. That just sounds like it could have been a win-win that could have worked all this out. Win, win, win. But as they say, hindsight is 2020, and I don't really blame anyone here on any side of this issue for how they reacted in the situation, because I can truly see the thought process that everyone went through. I will tend to side more with the people who were in the Facebook group than with Blair, but that could be my own bias because multiple friends of mine were in that group, and I will always err on the side of small creators getting credit for their work and having their work respected. 
to an extent, I feel like even framing this issue as Illuminati versus the Boo is Woo Facebook group did the entire anti-MLM movement a disservice at the time. At the end of the day, all of the content created was on the same side of the issue, and fostering infighting within an activist community only serves to grant more power to the companies trying to exploit us. So while there definitely were some conflicts involved, and there definitely were times that I felt Blair had been very disrespectful to people that I was friends with, including Madison and Savannah, at the end of the day, I thought, well, the work she's doing is good. Some creators are more aggressive than others, and at the end of the day, there's no need to sow further division among people with a common goal. So I continued to watch, and I continued to appreciate the videos that she released each week. I thought her video on Autism Speaks did a fantastic job exposing the, the corruption and harmful rhetoric that that company employed, especially since a lot of neurotypical people aren't aware that Autism Speaks is actually a horrible organization. And as a person who has fully grown out, cut off, and donated in my hair five times now, I liked seeing her break down the corruption going on within organizations like Locks of Love. Her channel was one of the only ones I saw going after these companies and explaining the harms they were causing, pulling back the veneer of charity work, and instead shining a light on these corporations for what they truly were. Unfortunately, Blair herself was also putting up a front and her facade was finally pulled away starting about two months ago when she got in yet another controversy, this time with the YouTuber Legal Eagle. Legal Eagle, the online name of a creator named Devin James Stone, is a YouTube channel with more than 2.8 million subscribers and over 500 videos all meant to educate casual viewers about the US legal system. Taking the approach of combining education with entertainment, Legal Eagle often responds to movies, video games, TV shows, and other pieces of pop culture from a lawyer's perspective. What is the church's status on this public university? And the answer is, it has no status whatsoever because it's not connected in any way, shape, or form because it's on its own land that is just nearby to the public university. And he's an actual lawyer. He's been licensed as an attorney since 2008, and since 2021, he's also worked as an adjunct law professor. Honestly, I really like his channel. I think he does some really great videos providing a lawyer's perspective on everyday life and popular media. So what exactly was the controversy here? Much like Illuminati, Legal Eagle also employs editors to help him with his videos. And honestly, I'm glad that he does because the editing in his videos is top-notch, snappy, funny, super engaging. Shout out to Legal Eagle's editors. Anyway, one of Legal Eagle's editors reached out to Blair in an email asking for help with a plugin for editing one of his own videos. Later, when Blair saw a Legal Eagle video using the same style of text highlighting effects that her editors used, she assumed that this editor had stolen from her and basically accused him of plagiarism. Soon after, it came out that this editor, while he did work for Legal Eagle, was actually looking for help with one of his videos for his own channel, and that the effect posted on Legal Eagle's videos was happening before this editor and Blair had ever even been in contact. Let's just listen to the way Blair herself recounts the story. My editors came to me about how parts of a Legal Eagle video looked similar to our videos. And then there were messages and an email from one of Legal Eagle's editors asking for more information about how we do certain effects. I looked at the compared images that were brought to me and I said, wow, that does look pretty similar. And I impulsively posted about it on Twitter. Truthfully, I should have looked into this more instead of just putting the information out there the second I had a gut reaction about it. I should have asked him what the emails were about, but I didn't. And I made a mistake and plain and simple, I was wrong. So to Legal Eagle and, and team, I just want to reiterate that I messed up and I'm sorry for any stress this may have caused you and of course to your team. So this is what Blair said on Twitter. Not legal eagle editors broaching my editors to take my video style and when they didn't give up the info, they literally copied it. And by the way, I have the messages from my editors and found an email from them too. Just changed the color from purple to blue, huh? Interesting. So I went through my emails and found this just outright saying, yeah, I'm gonna do this, but if you could make it easier for me, I'd appreciate it. So legal eagle ended up responding to her saying, hey, Illuminati, I think this is a big misunderstanding. Perhaps great minds think alike. No one on my team is trying to copy you. Without an exhaustive review of your channel, I believe we used those styles before your channel did. We've used them for three to four years. To show an example of this supposed plagiarism, Blair produced the following two screenshots, one from one of her videos and one from a Legal Eagle video, which she posted to her Twitter. If you've been watching me on this channel, then you probably know that I'm a writer a fiction writer, a nonfiction writer, a freelance journalist, and more. And as a writer, I care a lot about plagiarism and I take accusations of plagiarism very seriously. But while I think stealing another person's work is a serious crime, I also believe that there's a huge difference between theft and collaboration. Arts, and that's art in all its forms, including things like YouTube videos, is, in my opinion, an inherently collaborative venture. 
That's why I like writing with other people, why I enjoy having my friends read my writing and give me feedback, and why I enjoy doing the same for them. Bitch. The life of the reclusive, misanthropic writer has never appealed to me, no matter how much more of a hipster I become with each passing year of my adulthood. To me, collaboration is a key part of the creating process. That's to say, teamwork makes the meme work. And as seriously as I take plagiarism, when I look at the examples Blair provided, I just don't see it. I see two people highlighting text within their videos. Even if Legal Eagle had gotten this idea from Blair's videos, which he didn't as he'd been using this effect for years already, even if he'd seen the idea there, it still isn't plagiarism to highlight text within a video. I highlight text in my videos sometimes. That's like saying that me saying teamwork makes the meme work a couple seconds ago was plagiarism for whoever first came up with that joke and I don't know who it is who even came up with it because at this point it's a meme and it's just part of the cultural zeitgeist, the public domain of internet discourse if you will. Blair herself also didn't even invent the idea of highlighting text on screen that's been used in documentaries for years. But I get it. I've had times where I've seen creators, even those operating in similar genres to me, use similar things that I've used shortly after I've put out a video with a certain effect, like maybe a particular style of editing or a particular style of book reviewing or a particular joke or a certain pun. But do I publicly call these people out and make a big deal about it? Do I accuse them of plagiarizing? No, because YouTube is a collaborative venture. The better one person's videos get, the better all of our videos can get. If we share the knowledge with one another about how to continually improve our videos, the experience is just going to be overall better for creators and audiences alike. It's also kind of funny that right before this, we just talked about how Blair publicly attacked Madison from Cruel World Happy Mind because she thought it was so ridiculous that Madison could suspect her of plagiarism. But then Blair comes out with a even more ridiculous accusation of plagiarism phrased in a much more accusatory and much less friendly tone. Irony so rich my girl Alanis couldn't even handle it! So eventually Blair realized that she'd overreacted and she decided to apologize to Legal Eagle. We're sorry. She did this through a private DM but then later since there were a lot of channels discussing this drama she decided to publicly show the screenshot of her apology as well to prove that she really did apologize. We're sorry. She said, I want to reach out and apologize for my tweet yesterday. I was quick to protect my editors when they brought this info to me and I overreacted. I have deleted the tweets. Legal Eagle said, understood, thanks for the apology, and thanks for deleting. We're sorry. I'll be the first to say it, I'm glad she apologized. I know that the internet can be a really unforgiving place and we do have a tendency to hold our past mistakes against each other. I'm sure I've overreacted to fellow creators online before too. I've made so many videos at this point that I'm sure if you looked hard enough you can find me saying something really stupid or judging another person too harshly as well. So at the end of the day it's good that she recognized her error and reached out to apologize. Being able to recognize when you were wrong and admit that, that's something we should encourage especially in in this world of online content creation where we're gonna get it wrong sometimes. So Blair apologized to Legal Eagle, Legal Eagle thanked her for her apology, seemed all was well. No further conflict needed to happen, right? Well, not exactly. Because the whole issue with Legal Eagle had gotten a lot of people feeling a little bit skeptical about Blair, including her defensiveness and quickness to be reactive toward others. This is when another YouTuber named The Click entered the game. The Click is a commentary and reaction YouTube channel run by a guy named Mark. The channel has 1.25 million subscribers as of the day that I'm filming this. It has over a thousand videos, most of which are Reddit reaction style videos. The Click had been a collaborator with Blair as well as a few other YouTubers, a few few years ago on a combined channel called Sad Milk. According to Wikitubia, the YouTube fandom wiki, Sad Milk was a collaborative YouTube channel focused on reactions to various online posts, memes, and images. The members of the channel were collectively referred to as the Milkmen. The group also had a gaming channel, Streamed Milk. It has since disbanded. Basically, at the time that Reddit and meme reaction channels were popular, a group of reaction channels banded together to create a new reaction channel that was greater than the sum of its parts with the added benefit of having a group of friends all in one place to laugh and enjoy memes together. I can see how that would be fun. 
Reacting to memes with my friends is like my favorite pastime, I get it. Sad Milk included a variety of YouTube creators, but the ones we'll be focusing on in today's video are The Click, Wonderstruck Guy, Oz Media, and of course, Blair Illuminati. Because of Click's past involvement with Blair, his viewers began wondering if he endorsed the behavior that she showed towards Legal Eagle. Now, Click hadn't collaborated with Blair in more than two years, so he created a Twitter thread detailing that he and Blair weren't friends anymore and that he wanted no part of this drama. On April 23rd, 2023, the Sunday after Blair's debacle with Legal Eagle, YouTuber The Click left a long Twitter thread detailing why he and Blair were no longer collaborators, colleagues, or even friends. Don't come by my house. We're done. He said, Hey, you peeps, I've seen the recent drama regarding Illuminati and would like to clarify I am not affiliated with her and haven't been for over two years. I left her and her collaboration group, Sad Milk, due to similar behavior as seen in the recent events, lashing out at friends and fans, paranoia, and generally poor anger management, to name a few. Eventually, I believe pretty much the whole group left. The last meeting I ever had with her, she spent half an hour, I think, hard to know, screaming at me for an array of random things, calling me a bad friend, lazy, and a bunch of random accusations that didn't really have anything to do with me. There is no way that you can have the resume you have and be this fucking stupid and so on. No one even raised their voice back at her. I left along with several other members, half the group at the time. She spent the next few months spreading lies and half truths about us on the Sad Milk Reddit page and vague posts on Twitter. I still have all the screenshots. She would turn friends against you or specifically team up with people she knew didn't like you, so she had allies against you. Five days later, Blair released a video of her own titled Illuminati Exposed. I do think it's relevant to bring up that in 2019, the Clicks channel was terminated by YouTube for sexual content. At the time, a few YouTubers, including myself and Oz Media, band together to help reinstate Clicks channel. Oz spoke to his MCN representative, and I spoke with YouTube directly. This is something that I now look back on with so much regret. While the title of the video was meant to be a bit ironic, a little tongue-in-cheek, the video actually did unironically expose a lot of the conflicts that had been going on behind the scenes. I believe that he could be a pedophile. However, he cultivated an environment that was a breeding ground for inappropriate behavior with minors to occur, and that's exactly what happened. Blair denied that she had been the instigator in her conflicts with the clique, instead choosing to detail all the ways that she found him to be the problematic one, and how the only thing she ever regretted was even trusting him in the first place. Click, I hope you have learned to not tolerate such behavior in your server. I hope that you have learned from this and that you'll continue to strive to do better. I truly regret ever being friends with you. And I hope that I can finally close the door on that chapter in my life. I want nothing to do with you, and I can only hope that I will no longer be associated with you after all of this. Now, I can understand why Blair may have felt she needed to go on the defensive a bit here. After all, the Click's Twitter thread made some pretty big accusations in it, and all of them were pretty vague. At the same time, if those allegations were true, if she really had been abusing her fellow collaborators and employees and colleagues, and intentionally creating conflict behind the scenes, that really didn't bode well for Blair or her brand. However, the accusations she hurled against the Click in this video are pretty serious, namely that she accused him of excusing predatory behavior on Discord. Blair's video specifically stated that the Click had allowed a 19-year-old legal adult to brag about dating a 12-year-old child in his Discord server. If true, that's an extremely serious allegation. But according to the Click, that's not actually what happened. The situation brought up mentions a joining my Discord. It is said that neither I nor my team took action against this predatory person and actively chose to do nothing to resolve the situation, basically just letting them run amok. Click did not address it or wasn't fast enough, etc. Here are the DMs of said creep, full username, etc. that she has already showed in her video. Now the first detail that was conveniently left out of the accusations is that I was asleep. In my time zone, this occurred around 2am and within the span of me sleeping, this random creep in question had already gotten banned. I took the liberty to dig through the old ban logs of my server and here it is. He was banned at 2.14am my time zone. She brought one topic into a chat room, as she shown in her video and her accusations. However, her statement in these DMs about click knowing is very odd, as I would have been very unconscious when the ban was happening. She might be referring to me knowing by the time I woke up, but the fact remains I wasn't there, nor did I endorse this random creep. On May 2nd, just a few days after Blair's video dropped, the click made a response video of his own in which he proved Blair's allegations false, plus provided an entirely new perspective on what it was like working with her. Silver platter. In the allegations against me, it is claimed that I didn't react or respond to the situation. Number one, being asleep at 2am detail was completely left out. Two, the fact that he was actually banned before this whole thing was left out. And three, a receipt of Illuminati reaching out to me to get me to respond wasn't shown in her video or allegations. Well, I do think it's relevant to bring up that in 2019, the Clicks channel was terminated by YouTube for sexual content. 
At the time, a few YouTubers, including myself and Oz Media, band together to help reinstate Click's channel. To be clear, my channel was restored by the help of my network, which is a service I pay for. She might have tagged YouTube on Twitter or chatted with support, and I appreciate my friends who had my back throughout all this. I even thanked them in my return video, her included. Here it is. But the fact remains, she wasn't the one who saved my channel. If you want to get into specifics, Oz and Salty are the ones who networked me with this network initially. But the rest was done by myself and the network. We fought for three weeks over Christmas to get my channel back. Very odd high horse to try to climb on top of and claiming I should have lost my entire livelihood because of the events stated earlier in this video. So the allegations of the click supporting child endangerment were entirely false. In this video, Blair spent a lot of time explaining why child grooming is bad. I think most of us already know that, but then again, it can't hurt to remind everyone, right? I mean, it is a huge issue, but what I don't get is why did she spend so much time on this when talking about the click, considering the click had no part in this whatsoever? That would be like if right now, suddenly, I went on a rant about why murdering people is bad. I'm not saying that Blair ever murdered anyone, but it's important that I take a break in this video I'm doing right now to give you all a lecture on why murdering people is bad and you shouldn't do it, and maybe I should pull up some sources and resources on why you shouldn't murder people. I'm just kidding, you guys already know that. See how this doesn't make any sense? The implication that Blair is trying to make us believe is that the Click supported this groomer simply because he didn't immediately block him. But as the Click details in his video, being asleep at 2am detail was completely left out, to the fact that he was actually banned before this whole thing was left out, he was asleep when this creep showed up in his Discord. It's kind of hard to block someone when you're asleep. Did Blair just suddenly forget what time zones are, or was she being intentionally manipulative here? Accusing someone of supporting a predator is a very serious allegation, and one that should not be made lightly unless you are prepared to back that up. Those types of allegations are already not taken seriously enough by people who are being honest about them. And on top of that, that type of allegation can ruin someone's life and reputation if it's false. Honestly, based on the proof the click showed, it seems that he didn't really do anything wrong in this situation, and that his mods thankfully got the predator banned from Discord as fast as they could. In addition, the Click contests Blair's assertion that she was the one responsible for helping him get his channel back when it was banned. To be clear, my channel was restored by the help of my network, which is a service I pay for. But the other big revelation that came from the Click's video was the knowledge that Blair had been using alternate accounts to harass her friends and fellow creators online. And she says, 16 seconds, the alt account is gonna love this. In the next screenshot, you can see her writing out a draft. I saw in the Samuel announcement of all the Milkmen, I'm seeing the comments. Well, it's obviously not on good terms. Blair tweeting about being stabbed in the back, etc., etc. This draft matches with one of the posts made by an alt account called Doobie Schmertz on Reddit. And this is the entirety of the post. This is the truth about sad milk. It really looks like creative differences is dumb AF. Blair tweeting about being stabbed in the back, one topic, leaving his supporter server, and then so on and so forth. And I was a big fan of the click. I thought his streams were great, blah, blah, blah. But then I think Blair saw some of his streams. He did a stream where he watched some of his old videos. So this is actually Blair on an alt account, making the claims that Blair must have seen some of his old videos randomly. She totally wasn't paying people to dig up dirt. This is her on an alt account. Here is the same account, Doobie Schmertz, on Twitter. This was an account I remember distinctly from 2020, 2021, that was relentlessly harassing myself, my friends, my colleagues, my streaming colleagues, past colleagues, ex Sad Milk members, community members, stat you name it. You name it. At the time, I wrote it off as a disgruntled troll with a little bit too much time on their hands and tried my best to ignore it. This was Blair all along. Why? And it keeps going. Here it is on Twitter, tagging me, tagging her, herself. It's tagging Deaf Noodles. It's tagging Midnight Palma, Damien. It's tagging a bunch of people from the community and Salty. It's tagging Amanda the Jedi. In a situation very similar to the whole Creepshow Arden Lolcow saga of two years ago, Blair had been caught using false names to shit talk her friends online. What a nasty way to spend your time. Around the time that the Click had first posted this on Twitter about his previous interactions with Blair, another collaborator of both of theirs, a YouTube creator and editor named Wonderstruck Guy, posted his own Twitter thread as well. And as we get into Wonderstruck's story, this is where we'll really start to get into some of the ethical employment issues that have been going on in this situation. On April 23rd, Wonderstruck quote tweeted the Click to confirm that his recollection of Blair's treatment of them had been accurate. He said, after being threatened with a breach for speaking out, I can confirm that the behavior Blair exhibits is entirely accurate here. I'm aware of the bridges I burned and I remain where I am. 
After a sad milk split, it was a constant negative echo chamber that I took part in. Regardless, I used to edit for sad milk. Blair made no effort to take direction. She made everything about herself. Sad milk at the time was the nearest thing to family I had, which sounds pathetic, but the content creator space is a very isolating one. The amount of hours I would spend online making drafts, editor tutorials for new hires, staying up trying to get some editing in if editors were shorthanded. I miss Christmas with my brother and father fixing the mistake of the editor she hired and I didn't even get a thank you. And it took me more than half a month to even get paid. Meanwhile, she delays payments to editors so she can purchase expensive clothes, visit BMW dealerships, and spend hundreds on food in a day. While I do hold my beliefs towards certain matters, every month or so there is a new villain of the week. And they would one second be a normal person in our lives, and the next second suddenly a hidden monster through, you guessed it, Blair's mouth. To say sad milk split on creative differences is a joke. It's a flat out lie. Again, I'm aware of the bridges burned, but I can confirm that call took place where she screamed, cursed, and had a meltdown toward the click in one topic at a time. It was a train wreck. It was supposed to be a fun group project, and we'd become profitable even to a small extent. Blair wanted creative lead, and we went from doing fun creative topics more in line with the Reddit we would cover on our own channels to doing unenthusiastic view content. Blair took control and wouldn't listen to how the video should be made, and so we got hyper loud music with childlike sprites paired with adult humor, which just made being part of Sad Milk humiliating. My friends and I would watch Sad Milk and laugh not at the content, but at how awful it had become. Not due to anyone not being entertaining, but the lack of quality control. It was an editorial nightmare. It's why, in part, I stopped editing, because my really well-made content got roped into that by proxy. Blair did not care. It was hers, and anyone who dared to try ta to take the reins was a threat. After Click, OT, and Salty left, I did almost all the heavy lifting, which is a thankless job for being small on the internet. I tried making a schedules, I motivated Blair during another mental breakdown of hers to not delete the channel or the Discord since I actively read through the comments on both, and we had people who mattered too. After months of behind-the-scenes insults towards Click and OT, it became so stale and negative. Yeah, we all took part, but after it going on so long, it just became day after day Blair would would sit and check Click and OT Social Blade. She would make fake accounts to stalk them. Not just them, but a large portion of the commentary community. I've personally seen her try to get her lawyer to shut down anyone who says anything against her, and they ruined her day by saying, yeah, we really can't do anything. It's insane. Innocent people don't work so hard to try to silence others. We would get no work done. I can't count how many times I pleaded and set up meetings for us to do something and nobody cared. I thought I had a friend who was hurting. Then I saw I had moved to villain, and like everything else, I got shut out, trash talked, and the people I had made efforts to be friends with wouldn't even acknowledge my existence. For me, though, I had already moved states under good faith I was bettering my life. In 30 days of living with Blair, it was a nightmare. I felt like I was trapped in her home always. She makes everyone her enemy. She called Wonder checking in to see if I'm okay an invasion of privacy. I sent her numerous messages trying to show I wanted to be her friend. On April 28th, in that same Illuminati exposed video that Blair posted where she hurled allegations against the click, Blair also responded to Wonderstruck's Twitter thread claiming the following things about him. I talk often about how paying your people is important, so I know how ironic it must look to have that accusation thrown back at me. To begin, let me explain Wonder's employment history with me. During Sad Milk, all of us were contractors to that channel. We were paid as contractors so we could handle taxes in our respective countries on our own, as not all members were American citizens. As many of you are aware, video editing is largely considered gig work, and in the industry, most folks are contractors and work on a variety of projects for different clients at the same time. During December 2020, like all of the members of Sat Milk, Wonder was considered a contractor. On December 24th, 2020, at 5.39 a.m., I received a message from Wonder letting me know that he took a shot at reworking a video that had already been edited by a different contractor. I want to clarify. I did not ask him to do this. This was something he did of his own accord. I responded to him, letting him know that his edits would go live at 1 p.m. on December 24th, 2020. I don't want to claim to know what goes on in Wonder's personal life, but claiming that he missed Christmas with his brother and father, I just don't know how that's possible when the video was finalized early morning on Christmas Eve. And Wonder, I do want to thank you again, as I previously had verbally done so, for editing that video. It was great to have a video go live the day before Christmas. As for his claim that he didn't get paid for his work for more than half a month, I would like to let everyone know that Sad Milk's payroll was on a bi-weekly schedule. That simply means that there is a payment every two weeks, which is essentially half of a month. The end of 2020, I paid for his tickets to visit Oz and me in Colorado. During this trip, we discussed the possibility of 
wonder moving out to Colorado due to his discontent with his life in Texas. Oz Media and I had just moved into his newly purchased home in April 2021, and he decided to welcome Wonder into his house. Unless Oz Media was doing so without my understanding, Wonder was not charged any rent, utilities, or internet for sharing our living space. Later in May 2021, we welcomed Wonder into the house. Oz even personally drove down to Texas to get Wonder and his dog, James. I want to explain my perspective a little bit here. At this point, I was finally starting to feel comfortable with my channel, and I felt that I was in a good position to be able to help somebody out and truly change the lives of one of my close friends. I was in what I felt was a privileged position, and I wanted to share that with someone I cared about and wanted to see succeed. With that in mind, I decided to hire Wonder to do some editing work for my channel, and now we can get back to the continuation of discussing Wonder's employment. Wonder was hired on June 7th, 2021, and was salaried at $50,000 a year. To be frank, I just really wanted him to have an easier job so that he could focus on his personal channel, as he had told me numerous times that was his ultimate goal. His only task was to edit short clips from any live streams that I did, so that I could post them onto my secondary channel, Illuminati. In addition to his salary, he received all benefits that I have for all of my salaried employees, which include a 401k, full health insurance, and an internal benefit I created for my team called an LSA. The LSA stands for a lifestyle spending account, and it's essentially more money to put on the table if you as an employee want it. It allows you to submit receipts for things that you've purchased, and I've seen things like groceries, pet supplies, books, new tires for cars, massages, mortgage payments, and so much more. And essentially, I'll reimburse those into more income. During his employment, he never took advantage of any of the benefits that were made available to him. The content for Wonder to edit was dependent on me being able to livestream. During this time, I unfortunately only had two streams for him to work on, which Wonder would have been able to produce about four videos from. Wonder did not meet the deadlines for either stream. Despite this, I kept him on payroll, I continued his pay, even though no work had ever been completed. Although there was only a minuscule amount of work for Wonder to do, he still managed to act up within company spaces. He made inappropriate comments on forms that were visible to other employees, he didn't complete tasks that were assigned to him, and he failed to follow company protocol. I have a strict policy regarding formal disciplines, and within his short time of working with me, he had already met the criteria for termination. We were now once again in a he said, she said situation. Was Blair a controlling boss who wanted to handle every aspect of her employees' lives, or was Wonder a lazy and ungrateful employee who just didn't do his job well enough? Well, about two weeks later, on May 11th, Wonder finally released his own video responding to Blair's allegations as well as elaborating on his own. I was then offered, hey, if you want to edit a video, we'd be happy to pay you. I was such a new creator and I was so new to contract work itself that I personally thought $20 was fair pay for my work after my initial payment that I asked for was Burger King because I just wanted dinner. Obviously, I was compensated more than that for that video. After about three months in, Sad Milk became profitable though. So while yes, Blair did pay for edits, she was always reimbursed for this. But before we get into that, I think it's important to point out that there was one piece of Blair's video that was not up for debate, and it was this moment. What I specifically would like to highlight is that he insinuates that he had intention to and was taking action to arm himself to end his life. In a message directly with me, he explicitly told me that, quote, I was legit trying to get into my dad's gun cabinet to fucking kill myself. Either way, out of concern, I called the Austin Police Department non-emergency line to ask for a wellness check. And when I explained to the operator what was the situation at hand, they immediately transferred me to the 911 dispatcher. I then read the messages to them, and I gave the 911 operator the last known place of his residence in Texas, which was his dad's house, to perform a wellness check. The operator then told me not to arrange anything unless the police force is present. In his messages, Wonder states that he received a call from his therapist, which ultimately pulled him out of his intended plan. I'm really not sure what Blair was trying to do here. Like I said, comparing Wonder's Twitter thread about Blair being a terrible employer with Blair's video about how Wonder was actually a terrible employee, well, without further evidence, that was some he said, she said bullshit. But this moment, this moment wasn't. This was a moment where a former boss, a former friend, exposed the private mental health struggles of her former friend and employee. Without any prompting, without any outside stimulus, Blair showed a screenshot of Wonder's private DM detailing his plans to potentially end his own life. Whether you hate someone or not, to bring up someone's personal mental health as an arguing point is quite frankly a low blow. And it's not your story to tell. If anyone's going to explain my mental health, it is personally going to be me. Regardless of what else is happening in this situation, even if Wonder had been the worst employee in the world, nothing excuses putting that on blast. 
But as it turns out, Wonder wasn't actually even a bad employee. After hearing this, I'd assume you'd attribute me as someone with a very poor work ethic, and I honestly would not blame you. However, while Blair is being very anecdotal here, I'd like to provide receipts that prove the following. Proof that I was not kept on payroll, and I was fired before my deadline even happened. These were not short clips. The comment that I made on a forum that was grounds for termination, Blair leaving out how long it took her to actually provide content to edit, Blair leaving out that I had asked for work in various other aspects, my deadline extension due to my computer editing software corrupting, not me being lazy, me flying to another state to meet said deadlines with plane tickets provided, and again, proof that I was fired before my deadline even happened. Because in the video that he released on May 11th, he was able to provide proof that he actually did his job, and that Blair was the one at fault for the issues regarding his employment. Before we begin, I'd like to say that I was informally fired on a phone call July 27th, and that I received my final severance letter July 30th. But as you can see here in private DMs with an editorial manager, my deadline was extended to August 2nd. I was fired within my deadline. To add context, Blair had not streamed for the entire month of June, and come the further end of mid-July, she had finally streamed. I was given one stream that would result in two videos having 20 minute plus durations on both videos. Videos. So for context, these were not short clips, rather 20 to 40 minute chunks of content, which is exactly what I signed up for. This in itself was not a problem. However, upon getting far into making the video, my editing software corrupted. I was staying with my dad in Texas, which we'll touch base on why in a little bit here, and only had my laptop, which had never had an issue before. I had had this laptop for roughly, I want to say a year at this point. Never once had I run into a software corrupting issue. So I reached out to an editorial manager explaining the situation. They asked that I take PTO, but instead I held off because Osmedia said he could get my PC fixed. I was running out of time, but my deadline initially was July 26th. So last second, I flew to Colorado to get my computer just so I could turn around and fly back. It was at this time I had noticed I was locked out of the editor files, which I found odd given that I was still within my deadline, but I didn't exactly know what was happening, I just had figured it was an error at the time. I'd like to make note that the other editorial manager explained to me that my deadline at this time had actually been extended to August 2nd. Now, all of that was more than a month ago, but this situation has only since gotten worse and worse. A couple weeks ago, at the end of May, Wonderstruck released the following tweet. Hey everyone, hope you're well. As many of you know by now, during this ongoing situation, I received a cease and desist, demanding I remove my voice. Today, I have started a GoFundMe for anyone who wishes to aid legally in this matter, I intend to fight. And then he provided a link to the GoFundMe page. The GoFundMe page has now surpassed its goal, raising over $18,000 out of the original $1,000 he needed for legal fees. Wonder followed up on his original tweet by saying the following, any funds received will be sent directly to the retainer for legal fees. The remainder will be donated to a charity known as The Trevor Project, a charity designed to help LGBTQ youth in a multitude of ways. So it seems that all the excess money raised will be going to a good cause, which is awesome. LGBTQ youth right now are under a lot of concerted attacks, especially in the US. And I'm glad to see that at the very least, the attention that this GoFundMe has received is able to help that organization who's doing good work. But it's also so so extremely sad that Blair would want to stifle those sharing their opinions and their experiences about having worked for her. Remember, the entire reason that I was ever a fan of Illuminati in the first place, the entire reason her channel even grew to the size that it did and gained the fan base that it did, is that she called out unethical companies. She wanted to take down MLMs for exploiting customers and representatives alike. She wanted to shed light on the corporations that were abusing their employees, scamming their customers, and putting profit and money over people and relationships. Is Blair the one who's now stepping into the corporate casket herself? I do in fact have a car, I have a house, and I have a job. However, the one scary thing when you put all that on a spectrum is they are all provided by one singular individual, Blair. She had a hand in every single aspect of my life, and at any moment she could take it away when she felt, which is exactly what happened. What I don't get is, why does she get mad when others do the same thing back to her as an employer? Why is she the one who's allowed to call out shady companies, but she's immune from being called out herself? Now, don't get me wrong, I don't want MLM companies sending Blair cease and desists either. Like I said earlier, some of my friends who create anti-MLM content have received their fair share of legal threats and requests to take down their videos, and every time this happens, it infuriates me. The freedom to speak openly about our experiences online is one of the ways we can retain some semblance of power over companies who hold all of this money and influence over us. I'm glad that Blair has the freedom to expose these companies online. So why can't she accept that her former employees should also have the legal freedom to talk about their experiences working for her? Just last week, on June 6th, another former collaborator of Blair's, Oz Media, announced via Twitter that he'd also received a cease and desist. He said, So Illuminati has officially sent me 
a cease and desist. Best part is she cites parts of videos in which I had no part in and demands I make a public apology. Then he followed it up with, I haven't even made a video yet. He's not even supposed to be here today. So not only is Blair trying to silence her critics, she's also working to preemptively silence those who might criticize her in the future. Sounds like a lot of, uh, what's the term for this? What do we call it when we don't allow anyone to say anything negative about our company ever? Come and see the violence inherent in the system! Help, help, I'm being repressed! Call that... Toxic positivity! And it's a tactic often used by MLM companies, the very thing Blair claimed she was engaging in activism against. And where else do we see toxic positivity? Where do we see a leader who tries to scare people against speaking badly about them, who also wants to have some level of control over your home, your car, your income, your life? What do we call that? That's right, we call that a cult! During this time, Blair's channel has continued to upload regular videos, but with fewer views and much greater dislike to like ratios. While an average video for Blair three months ago would have gotten between 300,000 and a million views, her videos these past few months have struggled to even hit 100,000, with most now having at least twice as many dislikes as likes. These videos are still about her usual topics, the dangers of big corporations running grocery stores like Whole Foods, the shady practices going on at franchises like Subway, the problems with door-to-door -door sales and, of course, the MLM company exposés. Now, I find this interesting. The fact that Blair's new videos are performing so poorly. In the past, I've always noticed that when a creator gets cancelled, usually the worst thing that they can do is take a break from the internet. Because then, when they come back, the controversy will still be the top thing in their audience's mind no matter how much time has passed. Usually, it's the creators who continue to pump out their usual content that get past these controversies with the least damage but not in Blair's case. And I wonder why that is. I think maybe it's because of the Illuminati video that she put out in the first place. I mean, let's be real, Illuminati Exposed was a pretty terrible response. Outside of confirming that she apologized to Legal Eagle, which was actually a good thing, all she really did outside of that was create a bunch of new accusations against The Click and Wonderstruck, and then those two both then had the opportunity to thoroughly disprove that with evidence. And at the end of the day, there really isn't one rulebook or one set of guidelines to follow when facing massive waves of criticism online. My best advice is tell the truth, back up your claims with evidence, and then get back to your content. Seems like Blair did the last one, she got back to her content, but without the telling the truth and backing up your claims part, and I think that's the main missing ingredient in this pizza here. Since I started scripting this video, another YouTuber named Swoop has put out a comprehensive documentary more than two hours long about the downfall of Illuminati and her channel. This video delves even further into allegations that have come out against Blair, including her ex-boyfriend's allegations of abuse, showing patterns of behavior that are shockingly similar to the ways that Blair treated her in employees and friends. I'm not actually going to delve into that side of the story at all for two main reasons. One, because domestic abuse is something that I try to avoid talking about just because of personal stuff and I really don't want to delve into that. And second, because I really want this particular video to focus primarily on what other entrepreneurs can learn from Blair's failings since that's the area that I think I have a unique voice and perspective on for this topic. But if you want to see more of the angle of the story regarding relationships and potential abuse there, I recommend watching Swoop's video for that. Now that we're through, all of that. Let's move into the section that I really wanted to talk about today, the one place where I think I can provide a unique perspective. And for that, we need to ask ourselves this question. What can we learn from this situation? I'll do you one better. Why is Gamora? Whether you're a content creator, a business owner yourself, a creative person who likes working for small businesses or working with public figures, what can we learn from this situation about the ethics of business ownership and best practices for navigating the often muddy waters of working with friends, families, and loved ones? I also want to give a disclaimer here that I am not a moral authority on anything. I'm just another person learning business as I go and regularly trying to improve what I do. And while I do strive to be as ethical as possible when running my own companies, I also admit that there are places where I can improve. Like for example, I've talked about this before, I would love to get to a point where the clothing, merch, toys, and plushies that I all produce are all created with like sustainable and environmentally friendly materials and processes, but I'm not fully there yet in terms of the capital I would need to expand to that level to get that done to be able to afford to launch that in the first place. 
employees. And this is all to say that I'm not a perfect business owner, and I don't think anyone is. Like they say, there's no ethical consumption or production under capitalism, but that doesn't mean that we can't all try our best. In the meantime, we can just try to do the best we can with the resources available to us. While Blair of the Illuminati is just as much of a millennial business owner operating under the same shitty American systems that we all are, it's clear from my perspective that she really didn't try her best and that she went out of her way to manipulate her friends, family, and employees, which were often one and the same. Intertwining friendship and business is fine. Just make sure no one is ever reliant on each other or has complete power over another person. When I hire my friends in 100% of cases, it has been for contract work. Never have I ever hired a friend as a full-time employee with benefits, and every time that I've hired a friend to work for me, they've also been working for other people as well. The work that they do for me as a client is one freelance job among many. Now, I can't say for sure that this is like a universal rule of business ethics or anything like that, or that the way that I do things is without fail. Because here at Globo Gym, we're better than you! Because I can see the upside to being that employer that provides that salary and benefits to an employee. I can just also see how, when friendship and emotions enter the mix, how it can become too easy to intertwine your personal life with your livelihood. And then, if things go south in one of those areas, it's likely to affect the other areas, and then you end up not only losing a friend and bearing the emotional weight of that, but you also end up losing your only source of income and your only source of things like health insurance. Again, that's a problem with the system set up in the US, and we're all just kind of trying to work within it the best we can. And I'm not saying that this makes me a good or a bad business owner, but I do feel less stressed overall knowing that the friends I pay for services related to my business also make money elsewhere providing services to other people's businesses as well. Because if for whatever reason something doesn't work out in terms of the work, or me being able to budget for their role that year, or whatever else, it doesn't mean that I have the livelihood of someone I care about fully resting in my hands. I'll be honest, I love working with my friends. When when you already have a lot in common with the people that you're working with, and when you already share a sense of humor, you share similar interests and similar values, it can be easy to create a really beautiful product together. Hiring RK to edit my videos was one of the best decisions I ever made. Oh, fuck off, you big lamb! And because he's also my best friend of five years, half the time he can just predict the exact tone I'm going for in a video, or knows what joke to insert in a certain place that would make me laugh, just because he knows me so well. I'm glad I hired my good friend Sarah to be my manager on YouTube and my administrator for Forever Home Friends and Hipster Unicorn. When you have a person you already click with, a person you already love talking to, it becomes second nature to start brainstorming ideas together, bouncing things off of each other, having ideation and strategizing sessions, and having fun while doing it. I said no lies. I think he's telling the truth. But that doesn't mean that working with my friends has always gone well throughout my entire life. Way back before I started this channel, I had multiple occasions of trying to work with friends where we didn't share common goals with business, or where it turned out in the end that we were just being people in our early 20s experimenting with entrepreneurship without any particular clear vision. In these cases, sometimes the friendship suffered, sometimes the business suffered, and more often than not, it was both. And that could be really, really difficult to deal with. I still have this moment burned into my brain of this one time one of my friends invited me out to a cafe with her and then sat me down and told me she was no longer interested in trying to run a business. It felt like I was getting dumped. And in a way I was. Like a lot of things in life, working with your friends Mixing business and pleasure, as they say, can be a high-risk, high-reward venture. It has the potential to go very, very wrong, but those times that you get it very, very right can make everything worth it. And that doesn't mean, though, that the risks aren't worth talking about or that it's a decision to ever make lightly. I also think something else we need to keep in mind, while you may want to work with your friends and while you may want to be there for your friends emotionally and you can do both of those things, it's important to not mix and overlap those two things directly. Here's what I mean by that. One of the most recurring issues during Blair's past few years, one that many of her friends have repeated as having the same story, is that she tends to weaponize people's mental health or spread their private mental health information publicly. Now I think that if you're an employer caring about your employees, 
employees' mental health is important. And if you're someone's friend, of course you might know about the issues going on in someone's personal life and want to be there to help. But it's important not to mix these two things directly. And by that I mean it's unacceptable to use someone's mental health against them in making business decisions. If you're a content creator and the job you're doing requires sharing information with the public, you need to know that other people's mental health struggles are not yours to share. In the same way that many of us know by now that it is unacceptable in all circumstances to out someone publicly as LGBTQ, we also need to know that revealing someone's depression, someone's mental illness, someone's considerations to end their own life, those are not someone else's things to reveal. That's an important part of being an ethical business owner and a good friend. And Blair failed miserably at both of these things. Just, God, that whole sad milk story. It makes me so sad. <laughs> Watching a group of friends go from a place where they're enjoying each other's company, working towards turning a profit together, to a place where people are fighting, exposing each other online, vague tweeting about each other, and dissolving the channel. I could feel that pain in my gut. That story made me physically nauseous watching that unfold. Knowing how much I love working with my friends and having felt some of these experiences before, not quite on the scale, but you know what I mean. It's like if Wayne's World had a third alternate, even sadder ending where Wayne and Garth broke up permanently due to creative differences and could never mend the wounds to their friendship after the fact. That just hurts to think about. But I do think there's one other important thing to talk about here. One thing that Blair personally did very wrong that doesn't come up in a lot of these situations, but needs to be talked about because I see other creators and other business owners treading a little too close to a similar path. And that's the whole weird culty company town thing she was going for. I do in fact have a car, I have a house, and I have a job. However, the one scary thing when you put all that on a spectrum is they are all provided by one singular individual, Blair. If you don't know much about company towns, here's a little background. As Smithsonian Magazine reports, during the Industrial Revolution, company towns, communities built by businesses, sprouted up across the country. As Hardy Green, author of The Company Town, The Industrial Edens and Satanic Mills That Shaped the American Economy, says, these places ranged from the awful to the enviable. Towns built by coal companies, for example, were often more on the prison camp end of the spectrum in terms of poverty and abuse. Meanwhile, settlements like Hershey, Pennsylvania, built by the Hershey Chocolate Company, were meant to be closer to paradise, to woo workers with fancy amenities rather than mistreat them. Second, as Green explains, to speak about company towns in the past tense is to overlook that they still exist. The original coal and textile towns in America are now largely ghostly, but places like Hershey and Corning, New York, which was invigorated by the Corning Glass Company, are still going strong. Plus, as the LA Times writes, businesses such as Google and Facebook today are providing housing, amenities, and transportation for their workers. Meaning that, while we think of company towns in sepia tones, they're also in digital blue. Basically, a company town is a place where an employer owns not just the company you work for, but usually the house you live in as well. I think it's pretty easy to see how this setup can become inherently exploitative. And it shocks me that someone like Blair, who produces videos examining the harms of MLM companies and other exploitative corporations, wouldn't understand how awful this is. In anti-MLM videos that I've made in the past, I've even compared MLMs to company towns before. Though MLMs don't usually provide housing, a company like Amway gets a little too close to the whole company store concept, wherein they encourage and sometimes even require their distributors to replace their household items with Amway products, get paid in bonuses that they can exchange for more products. You know the drill. Similar to Mary Kay's Pink Cadillac, or really any MLM with a car benefit where the company leases a car in your name and you're on the hook for the payments if you don't sell enough. But you really don't own the car, it's just a method of control by the company. So what I don't understand is how Blair, someone who makes videos about how company control is inherently predatory and knows this, how she can turn around and do the same thing to her employees. If Wonderstruck Guy's statements are to be believed at face value, Blair was not only owning the house that he lived in, but she was also planning to go into real estate and buy houses for other creators that she employed or collaborated with, having them pay rent to her. Meaning that if anything went wrong in the business aspect of things, as they often do as this entire video has shown, then you're also fucked in terms of housing, in terms of your personal life as well. 
I made a couple videos on this channel before discussing the dangers of company towns and comparing them to cults. For example, a few months ago, I talked about how Elon Musk's plans to buy plots of land in Texas for his Tesla employees made me extremely uncomfortable and how his plans very much resembled a company town. It's not okay when Elon Musk does it and it's not okay when Blair does it either. What's concerning is that this concept isn't limited to just a couple of people. Recently, huge YouTube content creator Mr. Beast announced his plan to create a potential company town as well. As the website The Gamer reports, the New York Post reported this week that Jimmy Donaldson, better known as Mr. Beast, has been quietly buying up houses in a cul-de-sac in Greenville, North Carolina, in the area he grew up in. Over the last five years, he purchased his own home, then bought up the rest of the houses that surrounded his. Three of them were not up for sale and were purchased off market for almost a million and a half dollars combined. He purchased these homes for family and employees. On the surface, buying houses for people is a very nice thing to do. I know if I was as rich as Mr. Beast, I'd offer to buy houses for all my friends because I live in one of the most expensive cities in the world and some of my friends are in precarious housing situations. However, I'd also understand if my friends didn't want to accept a several hundred thousand dollar gift from me because of the imbalance it could bring to our friendship. They might feel like they owe me or that they're at risk for me trying to take their home back, leaving them homeless. Now imagine that exact scenario, but I'm also their boss. This leads to a number of pretty obvious problems if you think about it for more than in five seconds. Again, buying someone a house creates a dangerous power dynamic, especially if you're their employer. On the one hand, you guys know that I've got serial millennial entrepreneur syndrome and extremely extroverted disorder. And because of that, the idea of living in a big house or a connected apartment building or even just a neighborhood with a bunch of my fellow content creator friends sounds like literally a dream come true to me. That's heaven on earth if it could exist. At the same time, I wonder if it's because these creators like Mr. Beast and Illuminati are part of the millennial generation. They're still in a younger age group when it comes to the overall world of business ownership and real estate and being a CEO, that maybe they don't fully understand the implications of what they're doing. That when someone is on your salary, on your payroll, when you're in charge of their health insurance and their W-2 forms and their livelihood, that you can't also own the place where they live. That's just a breeding ground for an abuse of power to happen. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm sure this story is going to develop like 25 more times between me filming this video and this video going public on my channel, so we'll have to see on that. But I really hope that more than anything, we can learn something from this situation. Mainly, if you're on my channel and you're passionate about small business ownership and entrepreneurship, that you can take away some of the examples of what not to do when growing your business, hiring new employees, and most of all, working with people that you already love and care about. At the end of the day, it's also important to remember that while Blair herself may have been an extremely unethical employer and an overall awful person to get along with, a lot of the stuff she said in her anti-MLM and corporate casket videos was true. And that's what's so difficult here too. I completely support people not wanting to watch her content anymore. In fact, there are many much better channels that you can watch that also cover scams and shady dealings of big corporations, some of which I've mentioned in this very video. So I'd recommend giving other people your watch time and support instead of her. At the same time, I think it's too easy to often conflate a creator's content with them as a person. I think it's fair to dislike Blair as a person and to stop supporting her content. I know I will be. But I'm also scared that there are going to be people who use this to discredit the messages within her content. Remember, she didn't actually do the research or write the scripts for most of those videos. That was done by people that she employed, many of whom may also have been exploited under her influence. And those people did do honest work exposing real companies and their controversies. Hearing Blair's voice reading those scripts and seeing it in videos now, I get how that comes off as hypocritical. How can this woman critique CEOs and unethical companies when she is an unethical CEO herself? I completely get that, but I also think it's important to remember that the information in a lot of these videos was true. Black Oxygen Organics is a scam. Autism Speaks is an ableist organization that completely misconstrues autism. Locks of Love really isn't the charity that they pretend to be. MLM companies really are way too close in operation to pyramid schemes and we should avoid them. Her message was true, even if she herself was a lie. Please let me know your thoughts on this video in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I will see you guys again next week for more videos. But in the meantime, support small businesses. It's Pride Month. Support LGBTQ-owned small businesses. And stay skeptical, friends. Bye! Get you some nuts! Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who.